Hey everybody and welcome back to another edition of the Open Forum podcast. Today we have with us Senator Alex Antic. Senator Antic is a senator for South Australia from the uh, Liberal Party and uh, he also has a background in law himself, uh, 17 years if I'm not mistaken. Your law career is almost old enough to drink and if I'm not mistaken, um, Senator Antic also can do, maybe for us a little bit later, a great rendition of the Rockin' Robin but yeah. uh, we'll see if we can convince them to get that for us. But uh, Senator Santic, um, that's enough for me. Why don't you take a couple minutes to introduce yourself and then we're just going to jump on in, dive on into what's going on at the moment over there in Australia. Yeah, thanks, Sonny. Look, thanks for having me. It's great great to be here and um, great to be on your podcast. And yeah, some of that's true. I'd, I'd, I'd have to say from the outset that there won't be any singing. Um, that's because I want people to watch your podcast and not switch it off. So, uh, so we won't be doing any of that. But uh, it was a long time ago. Um, uh, look, no, that's absolutely right. I uh, like I've been in in Parliament now here in Australia for for almost three years, uh, and uh, it's been uh, it's it's an extraordinary experience and a real privilege. Um, and it's I suppose been uh, you know a, a a very interesting time and sometimes a very worrying time to be involved. I, I had a as you say, um, almost two decades in, in the law, which uh, is, a, is a great career. Uh, it does tend to attract, um, lawyers tend to be attracted to politics for one reason or another. It's a combination of the legislation and the combat, I think it's one of the two, but, um, but uh, here we are. Um, I'm, a, I'm a, um, I guess a product of a, um, a, a, an immigrant family here in Australia back from the 1950s when my, my grandma and my, um, my dad and his brother um, left the former Yugoslavia, a little stop in Paris on the way through, um, effectively running from the communists, uh, you know, after the post-war era in what is now Serbia in, uh, in, in the former Yugoslavia. So uh, it's, a, it's a, a lot of stories like this in Australia. Um, I speak to a lot of people from Eastern Europe and increasingly what they say to me is what we're seeing out there in the world and you know, parts of Australia, um, we've seen before in years gone by in our old country and it, and it worries us. So um, I guess that's, that's where I took some of my um, political inspiration from. I'm a, you know, our Liberal Party here is our centre-right party. It's a, a party which believes in free market, individual rights, freedom of speech, all the sort of things that, that you'd expect from, from that part of the political spectrum. And, uh, um, you know, I, I, uh, I believe in those principles uh, fundamentally and I, and I hope to try and continue to speak for them. Um, and I think the COVID period has provided a, a period in, in history where we've, we've really needed to, um, to sort of back those, those in because we have seen, I guess, the edges being chipped off. So it's the dissolution of rights, role. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and yeah. I, I think with your background in law, okay, it was a different section of the law, but yeah. it's, um, I think quite pertinent to to speak to someone such as yourself who who is well read in that area um so one of those things that springs to mind initially is the fact that you are a sitting senator and you're uh, a member of the liberal party who if i'm not mistaken are the party that's in charge at this point in time and right. yeah you've had a brush with the um quarantining situation having to go to a hotel yeah. and i know it's a story you've told a few times uh i think it's an interesting one to touch on uh straight off the bat to kind yeah. of give a bit of background as to what happened with you being put into the quarantine facility where your head was at with it and the fact that there was news media waiting for you on your arrival <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, look, it's 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 a. I, I mean, I can't tell you exactly what happened because I don't really know. It's but but just to give you a bit of perspective um, about all the things you've said here, Australia um, is broken up into multiple states. I think we've got six states and two territories here. Territories sort of have different but similar rights. But it's a big landmass for a small number of. We'll call them principalities. Um, each one has very similar systems of government, but they're all operating in their own sphere. And in almost every case. Um, the, the states in Australia over the last two years have, have basically outsourced a lot of the decision making about the pandemic, a lot of the medical decisions, the decisions about mandates and, and masking and all the other stuff uh, to, their, to their bureaucrats, to their public servants. And that's been the case here in South Australia too. And what it's shown um, is the, the limited powers that the federal government, so our prime minister uh, and his cabinet have over the operations of the states. There's a lot of power in the hands of of each of those individual states. 
that was showcased with, I think, with, with what happened to me, because here in South Australia, where, where I live and represent, um, our Emergency Management Act was uh, amended two years ago for the purposes of, if we all remember, two, two weeks to flatten the curve. We're now into well after two years, two years. Uh, of yeah. this. And, uh, and the idea was that a piece of a legislative instrument was used, which was designed for the purposes of um, coping with natural disasters. So, you know, it might be floods, um, the ability to give people, bureaucrats, the, the ability for short periods of time to take control and do whatever they needed to do. And that meant, as it does sometimes in the, the case of emergencies, losing for a very short period of time, some of the rights and freedoms that, that people, you know, the thought, no, no one likes that. But, you know, I think for a short periods of time, occasionally people put up with it. What's actually ended up happening though, is that has been completely and utterly um, extended for long periods of time now into two years. And those powers were extended to the point where um, our health bureaucrats and our police commissioner have got these extraordinary powers to do some of the sort of things you would you would never think and would want to see in a, in a community. I mean, really the police commissioner can come to your front door for no reason and take you away. The sorts of things that we've seen through other parts of the world. Now, in my case, um, what that's meant, uh, I travel to Canberra all the time. That's where our, our national parliament is. And you know, it's a bit like Washington in, in the United States. Uh, and each state has its own rules about travel and each state has its own rules about its borders. Uh, now, in my case, the rules were changed when we were away. Uh, and for uh, reasons best known to our health bureaucrats, the rules were changed such that it directed me either, first of all, not to come back at all. So they said, you can't come home. Um, and for, but following from that, they eventually conceded and let me go into what we call a Medi Hotel here in Australia, which is, I think, a foreign concept in many countries. I don't know if you have them over there, but um, for, a, for a while, and we still do that here, we, we, we were turning hotels, legitimate hotels into quarantine facilities. Um, we've police guards down the bottom, metal fences around, quite dystopian looking organisations. In the middle of our cities here, and capital city of Adelaide here had one, had two actually, or maybe even three, one apartment block. Um, and holding people in there for two weeks, um, you know, while they quarantine for, for, for a variety of reasons. In my case, I, I just couldn't understand exactly what that was. Um, we had, for the better part, had quarantined at home. Um, there was quite a lot of hysteria about transmitting COVID between borders, um, you know, which I think once again raises some concerns and questions as well. But, but ultimately, they said off you go for 14 days into a, into a Medi hotel. And that's, you know, I mean, that is what it is. But of course, the thing that really led me to believe that there were some political elements to it were the fact that 10 minutes after I found out, uh, I had a call from a journalist who also knew all about it. Uh, I hadn't told them. Somebody told them. And when I got to the airport, there were lots of cameras there to, uh, to take photos. Uh, and we found out subsequently that it had been quite premeditated. So uh, there was a lot of media interest locally and nationally about the story, about a, a person who, you know, I don't deserve to be treated any differently than, than anybody else. But ultimately, a member of parliament was being detained under public health orders by a public health bureaucracy, which should raise some concerns, I think, for people generally because you know we're meant to keep those two arms pretty separate so it was an extraordinary period of time um but it was i think useful to show the world some of what's going on in this country i know we've seen it in other parts of the world but certainly um you know to be able to say to people look this is not the country we want to continue with um was 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 important as well so you got to, they say when life gives you lemons you got to make lemonade so we, we spent two weeks trying to make a bit of lemonade out of all of that <laughs> Fair enough. Um, it's a different taste in lemonade from a quarantine facility, I can imagine. Correct. Yeah, um, it certainly is. Yeah. Um, we'll touch on to how it was within the quarantine facility in a moment, but I think quite rightly you point out there that just because you're a senator, you shouldn't be treated differently than anyone else. However, what I thought was concerning is that you had only recently spoken out about the situation, about the... Um, essentially the two-tiered society that was slowly developing with vax versus unvaxed kind of rhetoric and how that was being put across and th this was what time was it last year that this had happened well this was about uh it was about november december last year yeah. the beginning of december end of november yeah and a couple of the things that we heard last year from um dr kerry chant was you know 
don't talk to your neighbors don't be going outside you know um she seemed more concerned about getting other um shops in her speech rather than actually providing some positive message or some kind of positive outlook of what's going on and you spoke out to say look you know guys something's not quite right here you know where's the science can you guys share some of the data with us and it was shortly after that that you were then put into this facility now mm. some might think that it's retribution's probably a strong word but a bit of a, a way to uh, say get back in line and that they can do that to someone who is in a position of power for me is what's scary mm. um more so than anything else like you say you should be treated as everyone else but yeah. in that it seems like a retaliation is the thing that kind of scares me and again this is just yeah. eyes from outside the country eh yeah i mean look i i just don't know what the answer to that is it certainly does correlate to me and i'm still trying to get that information by the way i've been asking uh, we have a freedom of information process uh, here in this country and i and i have been since september the end of september of last year I've been seeking documentation um the health advice that our bureaucrats have been relying upon to do things like um put limits on the number of people that can go into a shop to re require people to check in with qr codes to go into a business masking requirements vaccine mandate requirements all of these sorts of things that you would expect given the effect they've had on our community and the, the effect they've had on our businesses you would expect would be based on very sound medical evidence well so i've asked for that evidence and to date um, the health bureaucrats in this state are still ignoring uh, lawful directions from one of our statutory authorities to provide it so I, look i can only assume that there were um you know some there's some resistance to providing that documentation the timeline kind of marries around i mean it was only i think a week prior to being told to go into that midi hotel that i had upscaled it to one of our statutory bodies our ombudsman here in south australia so i don't know but somebody clearly wanted to um to let the press know that this was the uh, the outcome and uh uh, and that's where it lay. So, uh, look, we'll never know the answer to that, probably. But, um, but certainly, uh, there was there was a lot of interest in the story at the time, and and I think we've seen multiple examples of that. We've had people um, in the most inexplicable ways, not you know, not just because they're people that, that bear the office of, of the Senate, uh, like I do, but but people who've been uh, taken into uh, hotel quarantine, who have been. Uh, you know, who have been taken into some of these quarantine camps that I know are of, uh, of interest as well um, around the world. We've seen a few of those. So, so there's been a lot of, um, I guess, I hope it's not making it up as we go along with a health bureaucracy, but that's what it feels like from the outside. So I would have thought if there was strong medical evidence, you'd be, you'd be absolutely breaking down Plain the doors to, to show it. people. Yeah, yeah, you'd be throwing it in people's faces. They'd be printing it out so, and putting it on your chair when you walk into the Senate. Like it was yeah. a handout coming into church. That's but, right. Um, you mentioned there the quarantine facilities. Now, Howard Springs is the biggest one that we know of. Um, and that recently uh, did the rounds uh, across mm -hmm. social media a couple months back in December. As you mentioned before, we got chatting. There was the young lady that had a, the, her time there and managed to document it a little bit. Can you maybe talk to us a little bit about that? So it's in the Northern Territory. It's under the yeah. control of uh, one Michael Gunner. And there's been some scary stuff. So I'm going to preface it with what I saw in the uh, news uh, speech that he did, where he mentioned that they were using the army to uh, place people into the quarantine facilities. And they were to helping to relocate was the way that he worded it. And that seems quite frightening to think that at the drop of a hat, because I think at that period of time, nine people had tested positive within mm -hmm. uh, the indigenous uh, uh, populace there in the Northern Territory. So then they were decided to relocate them and about 30 other folks and required extra support to do so. Can you maybe talk to us about that as someone who's got eyes on the ground there? Yeah, look, I think, I mean, one of the things that that, that I suppose in this country we've we've taken some degree of pride over, I suppose, is border control. Um, and we've got a very good track record of keeping the borders safe. And that that is a political um, football in this country in many ways. But ultimately, it's a, it's a good thing. Countries should be entitled to protect their borders and their national sovereignty. Um, 
that was always the excuse for detention centres. People coming into Australia that may not have another way of quarantining with COVID or whatever it may be. Um, and for a short period of time early on, maybe that made a lot of sense. But governments, state governments and territory governments around the country, including here in South Australia, have been commissioning and building what are basically camps. They're, they're, they're described as um, you know, quarantine facilities, but, but in reality, they're massive detention facilities. They've been used for even as much as uh, in, in, coming back from the, the summer games, they were used um, by, uh, by people, you know, athletes who were, who were confined to these cabins as they came back in. Um, but there have been instances where people, in the case of that young lady, uh, the story she tells is that she was um, approached by the police a day or so after she was seen walking next to somebody that ultimately ended up testing positive for COVID. Um, because of her license plate on her on her uh, motor scooter, or I think it was, uh, and detained, taken away, and put into this this um, quarantine facility where she stayed for two weeks. And I can tell you, having been inside uh, one of them, um, you know, it looks okay. People say, "Well, what's the problem?" You know, it's a nice little hotel and so on. But the reality of being inside one of these facilities when you can't leave is, by definition, being detained. It is, you know, it's a deprivation of liberty. Um, meals are provided at certain times. It's, it feels like being in prison. It's a very uncomfortable environment and a very uncomfortable precedent that's being set. And if you look across the world, places even, you know, places in Europe, I know, I think Iceland last week on Friday removed all restrictions, I, I yep. like to believe. Um, the rest of the world seems to be moving away from this COVID paranoia. Um, yet in Australia, in Queensland, another one of our states up north in the northeast of the country, they've, they've just opened another facility. It's called a wellness camp or something like that. South that's Australia here has one. Yeah, that's right. Another one. So we've, we've got these facilities that are still operating. And the question has to be, why? What, 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 what is the point of them? Um, why do we need them on an ongoing basis? And, you know, is it a really, is it a good look to be, to be locking people down in these facilities? You're quite right. I mean, as it stands here in Australia, uh, we've had a very fortunate um, but very limited um, run with COVID. It's really only since Omicron hit the shores that we've had experienced a number of cases. And, you know, um, really, it's proven to be very mild and very flu-like. I don't see what the ongoing reason for these camps is, but um, you know, they, they're being built. And, and I think, you know, I think people should be asking those questions. They don't seem to be getting a, much of a run in our mainstream media here in Australia, which has effectively provided a massive blackout for these sorts of issues. Um, two, three weeks ago, we had, as you've had in Europe as well, these massive protests. Mm. Um, we had the biggest protest that, that our capital city, Canberra, has ever had. Um, and all the media have done in this country is try to step on it and dampen it down. Mm do the sorts of things they've done in other countries, label people like they did in, in Canada um, who are attending these rallies as uh, extremists, a fringe group, yeah, um, racists and, so on and, and so all the rest forth. of it. Racists, yeah, yeah, all yeah. of that, you know, for, for whatever reason, this, you know, demon, uh, you know, demonization of, of people um, who are simply looking for the sorts of things that 20 years ago were, were taken for granted. So there's, there's, there's some worrying developments in there. Um, and, uh, you know, Australia has had a worrying number of them. The Northern Territory is a particularly bad example, I might say. Yeah, Northern Territory is kind of where a lot of the, the worst news comes out of, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it was in the Howard Springs facility where they said that it was a voluntary facility, but then you heard yeah. about the two lads that managed to escape and were hunted yeah. down uh, yeah. like convicts and then yeah. placed back in and smacked with yeah. fines. I'm not sure if the fines were followed through at all. I know. But, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting development there with, with, you know, the sort of the history of Australia as a penal colony. There are those that say, you know, we've come, come back. back to those convict roots. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you started to miss it and all of a sudden it's it's there. When but ball and chain is back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with quite, that but, said, yeah. it, it almost feels like it's, like you mentioned, Omicron seems to be a lot milder relatively speaking in terms of deaths it's a lot lower relatively speaking in terms of hospitalizations compared to delta and the original it's also a lot lower it almost seems like by building more facilities it's an attempt to hold on to that power that the uh, bureaucracy has gained and not to let it go would that be a fair it's it's an assumption but a fair yeah, assumption it's an assumption me. it it is an assumption, but I think it's a fair assumption. I, I, I mean, from the very get-go, when it was being proposed that our parliament here in South Australia um, were off 
offloading some of these powers, so many of these powers to the bureaucracy, there were only a handful, but there were a few of us who said, this is going to be very, very difficult to unpick. And we've seen that play out, um, I think, in real time over the last two years. Um, I, I think there is a, a natural inclination for public service, servants, bureaucrats, and, and so on to, to build fiefdoms. And I think that's what, probably a little bit what you're describing there at the moment. We had um, a year ago, uh, basic bureaucrats working through these processes. And now we find that there are departments built severe, just strictly around COVID. You know, people have been employed specifically for the purposes of managing COVID, liaising with businesses that want to know how their COVID management plan can roll out. And I think probably the quarantine facilities fit into that category as well. Um, it, it, there is a natural inclination for uh, power to be very difficult to grab back from bureaucracies without significant political will. Um, and at the moment, I, I think that's probably right. Queensland's another state that, that has, has been pretty difficult and harsh. Western Australia as well. Western Australia still has, I believe, a locked border with the rest of the country and is almost pushing back in the opposite direction with restrictions. The, wow. only, um, the only conclusion you can draw from that is that there are those politically and bureaucratically who, who seek to continue to make sure that the, the, man, the emergency continues in order to, to hold on to power. It's, it's, I think it's inevitable to, to conclude that. Yeah. I, that's also worrying because one of the things that they've done with these emergency powers, essentially, is create this two-tier society and one of the things that i read coming out of northern territory i think it was was that if you were in the quarantine facility because you were unvaccinated if you were to take your vaccinations then you'd be able to get out early yeah and it, it's it is coercion let's call a spade a spade it's coercion at the end of the day if you do this we'll reward you with your freedom right as someone who studied the law again okay a different aspect to law but how does that sound to you when you hear that people are being told if you're gonna if you're gonna play nice with us we'll give you your freedoms back yeah look i i and i one of the great shames uh, in 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 my way of thinking is the the lack of voice from the legal profession we haven't we haven't seen anything out of our legal profession that has even pushed into those libertarian roots that, that the lawyers used to be for, for renowned for in this country the medical mm. profession has been very silent as well, but they've had some additional challenges with uh, their regulatory board, the regulatory framework, where they have really been lent upon by um, the regulators, the medical regulators, in many instances, to tell the story as it's, you know, as they want it told. That is, there's nothing to see here. Uh, this is the only treatment option. And if you stray from that narrative, we're going to we're going to investigate you. So there's been a lot of that as well. But we haven't had much pushback on some of those fundamental principles. And I think the media... Um, have a role to play in that there's a you know I mean I think a very important role in the media for having um, the ability to talk through these issues and discuss them in a legitimate way lots of really important questions that come out of this period none of which seem to have been asked by anyone other than people like yourselves in the independent media who are doing great work and, and it's why I'm always so keen to to talk to people like yourself who, who who are talking about these issues things like is it right to make somebody buy their freedom through that coercion i, I think it's in, entirely wrong and i and i think uh you know from a from a, a legal perspective it's entirely wrong um and I mean, it's just what one example you've used there is a very good one but there are many many others as well um in the northern territory back around about that time december or november um the government there uh, declared that if you were unvaccinated you would have a series of restrictions on your everyday life. You wouldn't be able to go further than 30 kilometres from your home. Uh, you would have access to, you wouldn't have access to certain other than basic um, necessities, you know, supermarkets, yes. necessities and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, and we saw this coming out of places like France as well. I think uh, the president Macron there has made some comments about we're going to make your life miserable if you're unvaccinated. Yep. I mean, I just, it is hard to believe you're hearing these things in 2021 in Western liberal democracies. And yet it's hard to believe that the, the law isn't providing more protection for people's rights, right to choose, the, 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 the sort of the basic rights of individual freedom to choose your own medical care, things that are, you know, here in Australia, we have the Australian Immunisation Handbook, which is a document prepared, it doesn't have um, specific legal force, but it's a, it's a mission statement, if you like, on these sorts of things, and it's been completely flouted. 
um, you know, uh, the, the, the Nuremberg Code, which is often cited as well, but, you know, it just seems to be that these basic principles of allowing people the right to their own medical autonomy uh, is just being thrown disregarded. Out the and yeah, it's thrown, thrown out, out the window. Window. So, yeah. Yeah, Maybe the and, and once again, it comes down to this concept of this is an emergency, so we don't want to talk about it anymore. And that's the worrying thing for me is what, what's the next emergency that gets rolled out that, that requires us to cash in more of our freedoms and more of our rights? I think more people need to talk about it. And that's why what you're doing is so important. Depending on who you ask and where you're looking, what documentation you're reading, I think the next one's probably going to be the climate emergency that we're seeing. Yeah. But that's a whole yeah, other I, kettle I, of fish. I don't disagree with you. Yeah. And, and in fact, to many people who ask that question, I, I totally agree. I, I say, well, you know, let's see how you go when you go to the supermarket and you can only buy one steak for, for an Aussie barbecue over here because, you know, we're in the middle of a, a climate lockdown and the app on your phone doesn't let you do it. I mean, I, I think you're right. I think we're, I think that's if we're not careful with our rights and freedoms, a social credit style future awaits. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, coming back to what you said about Macron, um, someone just over the water from yourself, Jacinda Arden. I've seen video mm. of her laughing when asked about a two-tier society. What? You know, um, you you, uh, you also mentioned uh, Michael Gunner talking about the, the five reasons, I think it was back in December. Mm. I also heard back in January now, so uh, give or take six weeks ago or so, he was mm. talking about cutting that down to three reasons to leave in your house, or has that now changed? So that yeah. was then essential services, medical treatments, and to provide support or get vaccinated. <laughs> that was the other one. I think that's where it got to. Yeah, I think it was it was that sort of clamp down, which, um, and look, you know, here in Australia, um, we, we've, I think we're up to three doses to be current. I've changed the language a little bit. It used to be fully vaccinated. Now it's up to date today um, yeah. you know so with a view to potentially you know what, how much more and these are questions that i asked of our um our statutory body there's a body called ATAGI, the australian technical advisory group on immunization which really makes recommendations and uh we have a, a you know an, a, an inquiry process um twice a year sometimes once more uh here in the senate where, where i sit and we've asked, and i asked that question of of that body um can you guarantee there won't be a fourth and a fifth injection to be up to date no, they can't. Um, and and so, you know, this is the concern is where does it stop? Where does the treadmill stop? And when do you get back to normal? And where's the political will to do that? Um, and, you know, I, I, I think they're really live, live questions. I, you know, we've had, I mean, here in South Australia, uh, to use that social credit example, one of the things that was designed to stop people like myself from going into many hotels was uh, an app which was developed here by the health bureaucrats um, which was as dystopian and as alarming as anything uh, I've ever heard. Uh, I seem to be the only one that ever had any concerns about it, but um, it was a, it's a piece of software that, that sits on your phone when you're quarantining at home, mm. which um, sends you a message three times a day and you're required to uh, hold it up, take a photo of yourself, upload the photo. Um, and if it's, if you don't, if, and it takes your, your biometric facial data and your GPS location, and if it doesn't all match up that you're where you say you are, you get a knock on the door from the police. Now, this is, you know, this is the sort of stuff they're doing in, in Xinjiang in China. Uh, and yet it seems to have passed straight through once again, because we're in the middle of an emergency. So, you know, what are people prepared to cash in, um, for the sake of this? And, and you, you're quite right. You come back to this concept of a two tiered society. You know, I think we're in dangerously, in, you know, perilously close to developing that as we speak, um, with many more who are perhaps less inclined to continue with this endless stream of vaccinations, who may end up in that underclass or subclass of unvaccinated simply because they haven't had their four, you or know, fifth. injections. So yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's dangerous territory and, uh, and it needs to be arrested very soon stopped i should say rather than arrested <laughs> yeah it's probably a better use <laughs> of words, words there, yeah. yeah um i that that um is something that's quite uh concerning when i first heard about it actually because if you don't respond then they send the police around regardless right so let's oh. say you left your phone in uh in your bedroom while you were mm -hmm. downstairs cooking or something mm -hmm. or if you had music mm -hmm. on you might mm -hmm. get a knock on the door from the police and you might yeah you uh, might well, and, and and that's right. You might well, yeah. And the other it, thing it's, is, it's almost worse than you would get if you were an offender. I mean, our, our home detention system with a home detention bracelet here in in this state doesn't require that kind of uh, as as, as best I understand it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, 
you know. And, and there's also the law that was passed. I don't know if it's still there, but I, I'd read about this where the police could come in without a warrant to check to make sure that you're there. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And in fact, when people have been, um, uh, you know, quarantining at home, and and I have been in that situation as well, throughout the course of the last two years, the rules have changed more times than I've had hot dinners. But uh, at one point, when we we as parliamentarians were required to quarantine at home, um, you know, we would get um, occasionally a knock on the door and just to make sure you're here where you say you are. And you know, I think the sad thing about it is the police um, would often not want to be doing that. I, I mm. you can almost see. The police, of course, have been one of the professions here, the public professions here that have been mandated vaccination. And there have been many, many police officers that have refused. Um, and some are before our courts at the moment, trying to trying to get the courts to intervene in that. So, um, you know, I, that's not what you sign up to the police force for, I'm sure. No, not at all. And then you also mentioned the situation around the vaccines. Have you um, looked at the agreements that the Australian federal government made with uh, vaccine agreements to see how many they bought? No, look, no, I haven't because uh, they're treated as commercial in confidence. So we don't we don't get to see them at this stage. Um, right. But there have been hundreds of millions of doses purchased. In fact, um, the federal government here purchased 250 million, I think, just before Christmas, um, when something like 90 percent of the population was uh, up to two, two injections. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't I haven't seen that. I, I have seen documents from other countries, I must say, that that are, or purport to be contractual documents from other parts of the world, which if, if are similar, would lead me to be concerned about some of the indemnities that have been given by, um, you know, by, uh, by governments. Yeah, um, so but, there's no, the, I, haven't, I haven't seen it with my own eyes, no. So there's the contract contracts, but then also just the sheer volume that have been bought as well. Mm. Um, and the sheer volume, I've, I've got the web page up, um, if you don't mind my sharing my screen. Yeah, sure. Um, so this is from uh, health.gov.au mm -hmm. and this goes over all the different vaccines and the volume that they've bought and at which stage and I think from Pfizer alone it adds up to roughly uh, 100 million doses um, when you look at what was ordered what's been purchased and then mm. what's interesting is that they were already planning and buying Moderna for uh, 25 million doses and planning on getting the uh, variant specific versions available in the first half of 2022 and this was back in in august so it your population is only 25 million and they've bought enough to like you just spoke about of four or five vaccines mm. they've bought enough to definitely go over the top of that for sure mm. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that's, that's right. Um, yeah, they can't give you any guarantees, but they've definitely bought the stock for it. Yeah, and and I mean, I, I, that's yeah. right. No, look, I haven't, and uh, I can only tell you what I what I know from from that interchange as well. Um, and I don't know what the numbers are like on the uptake of the the, the third booster. They're not they're not strong. Uh, I think uh, increasingly people are saying, well, you know, we we were told. But at 80% uh, of the population getting two doses, we would go back to normal. Uh, and here we are. So, you know, I mean, I'm not a doctor and I, you know, I sort of, I, I don't try and get into the weeds about safe and effective uh, on, on the vaccines because I, you know, I'm just completely out of my depth. But I will say that the numbers of people that are getting that third dose seem to be, you know, difficult, pushing, pushing the boulder uphill, so to speak. And, Increasingly, I guess that will be the case. My, my concern is, um, you know, what is done in order to ensure people continue to take them. I, 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 we've seen, I guess, over the last two, you know, little period, not two years now, but it's, it's sort of nine months or so, nine, ten months, um, you know, what the states have done to sort of coerce people into getting the first two. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about any further coercion. Uh, and these, these really should be personal decisions from people, particularly when there isn't a track record of, of, uh, of use. There isn't, there isn't the data to say, uh, you know, this is, this, this is, um, you know, this is what this therapy does. And I, that's, that's beyond doubt. So um, people deserve to have their own choice and, uh, and they should get it. Absolutely with you there. I mean, I've um, 
got a background in biosciences as well um and i've looked at the data quite heavily and one of the things that pricks my ears up is the fact that we don't have long-term safety data we don't have uh, data going over the different uh the mix and a match and i don't know if they're doing that in australia but the mix and a matching of vaccines in the uk or in the netherlands and these are things that anyone with a scientific background or anyone can look at and say hold on a minute this should have been looked into first before it was rolled out on mass and like you say uh, we're not going to get into the weeds of that today um mm. i think that's a whole other conversation that can be an extra yeah. two three hours on its own yeah, correct. Yeah. but um coming back to the coercion aspect with everything that's happened in australia over the last couple of years with your ability to go outside being limited your ability to exercise being limited you having to yep. work to these trivial demands um there's something that springs to mind and it's Biderman's chart of coercion. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, I'm no, I'm not. Um, I, it's no. uh, Albert uh, Biderman. It was uh, made after the Korean war for the torture that was uh, inflicted upon us serving soldiers. So he then created a bit of a timeline of how they went about things. And what I'll do, I'll read out the list. And if you can think of anything that, um, springs to mind or if any of these are applicable to australia i i'd be interested to know so it starts off with the isolation it then goes on to the monopolization of your perception humiliation and degradation exhaustion threats occasional indulgences and showing omnipotence and then trivial demands and it's an eight-step process of how they break people down in order to as it says on the tin, coerce those that are there. Now, mm. when you hear that process, does any of that ring true to you? Do you think? I, I think I think a bit of it does. Um, there are a couple of interesting ones in there um, that just to sort of spring to mind. Um, the trivial requests, I think, was one that, that sprung out. Uh, we've had a host of these. So. Um, having a pretty normal uh, business sector where people you know come and go in small business hospitality whatever it may be um, many of them have almost learnt the dance that has been put in by uh, by uh, the, the the health bureaucrats here which has been you know it's incredibly trivial things like you must wear your mask at a sporting event while you're walking through to your seat once you find your seat you may take your mask off yeah. um and then sit there because for some reason that you know that's your so there's this trivial exercise of theater we would call it COVID theater for a long obedience, time obedience yeah obedience correct uh the other one was the, the, i don't know if this term has gone international but the, the term vertical consumption when it comes to alcohol uh but it became a thing in south australia where we were told that you could now i gotta get this right because none of it makes logical sense <laughs> i gotta think through what actually yeah. happened uh the 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 to, to stand at a bar uh, you you couldn't stand at a bar and drink. You had to be sitting down uh, in order to prevent the spread of COVID. Uh, to drink, so there's this concept of we would return vertical consumption, you know, on the second of whatever March, da da da, you know, all that sort of stuff. So these trivial displays of you know rubbing you know rubbing your tummy and patting your head in order yeah. to do it. That, that's the one that probably jumped out. I mean, are they all applicable? Um, you know, this almost shaming of uh, you know of people, and I, and I think. You know, my experience in having the cameras there ready to watch as you went off to a medi hotel, I think probably were part of that experience. Yeah. It doesn't bother me. I, you know, I, I, you know, quite like having my photo taken. So I didn't politician, mind, but... you're used to that. Yeah, aren't you? yeah, yeah. yeah. great stuff. I, and in fact, the irony of it was that the, the cameras were waiting for the moment to catch me walking with the police officer. Um, we we happen to just be talking about sport, so you know, I mean, the, the, the truth, you know, the, the never let the truth get in the way. It was quite innocuous, but uh, the whole exercise clearly is designed to, um, you know, to to sort of uh, you know point the finger and you know whatever it may be. So all of those, I think, were, were pretty applicable to what's going on here, uh, for sure. Yeah, and it's like you said, the the perception of the media. And you've brought it up a couple of times during our conversation thus far is that the mainstream media, if, if we, we're going to use that, that term for it, they've not done a good job at no. reporting what's going on. And they've had these blanket bans and there's something, um, you know, 
as you can probably hear from my accent from London, um, mm-hmm. they have the Trusted News Initiative there. And what they do is, uh, you're familiar with it just for the listeners, is uh, to prevent any kind of vaccine hesitancy or what they would deem mis or disinformation, they will prevent any of that hitting the airways and mm-hmm. will uh, do their best to stamp it out or provide an alternative viewpoint. Uh, or a fact checker or what have you and fact checkers as we now know from a lawsuit uh, are just opinion pieces rather than actual facts and um, that's one of the interesting things I don't know if the TNI uh, in Australia or operating within Australia uh, but it is a collection of different news agencies so that could also have heavily impacted the way that news was brought across in Australia no? Yeah, and I know that's been happening in New Zealand. I think they've been doing something similar as well. We haven't had quite the same experience, but our media has been compliant with the with the narrative. There's no doubt about that. We uh, here in in South Australia, in my home state, we're a one newspaper city, a city of about one point five to seven million. You know that kind of number, uh, and we, we only have the one newspaper, and it it, it has been. Um, wholly compliant with the uh, with with the, the common narrative of uh, you, you know lockdowns, vaccinations, you know almost you know um, towing the line, I suppose. For whatever reason, they have all done that. We've had a couple. We've, we have we have our Sky News here, which has been okay, but even they have been um, scared into submission by being the threats of being banned by YouTube for talking about other potential therapies other than um, you know other than vaccination. So. Uh, it, it's been a very, very challenging environment. We, you know, we've noticed it for even just the protests. I mean, we, we have never had, in my living memory, my 47 years, um, this kind of on-the-ground presence from citizens of this, this country, all across the country, just prior to Christmas, um, in, in October, November, I think there were some, it was about the time where they were happening worldwide. We, we had huge protests in Australia, uh, none of which were being covered. And when they were being covered, um, the press were very insistent on picking out the one or two, um, you know, stragglers who were doing something distasteful um, in order to smirch, besmirch the entire uh, crew as being crazy, radical, white right. supremacists, yeah. uh, yeah. you know, uh, anti-vaxxers. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I've seen them with my own eyes. I've spoken at a couple of those rallies. Uh, and what I saw were people that were losing businesses, that were worried. Um, I saw doctors, lawyers, small business people, nurses, police officers, you know, d- just uh, regulation Australians who are worried. And, um, you know, so the, the, the news media, uh, the legacy media, the mainstream media, whatever you want to call it, uh, have caused to hang their heads in shame over the last two years. Uh, and uh, that's why I think that more and more people are picking their news from alternative sources. And, you know, obviously you're a, you're a part of that ecosystem, which is a great credit to you as well. So, um, this is the future of media. Fingers crossed. Yeah, um, we can yeah. help to to spread the good message of what's truly happening as as best possible. Um, I always say there's three sides to every story: your side, my yeah. side, and the truth. Yeah, um, right. yeah, everything's about perspective, right? But Absolutely. with with that said, then what what can can you do from your position you're in a position that should be able to affect some change with everything that you've seen going on um you've spoken out uh, i've seen videos of you speaking out in parliament and whatnot but what is it that, that you can do or that the uh, average australian can do there on the streets because uh, protests uh, only seem to be getting us so far and we've sort of slipped from in my eyes i said this i had a conversation with one of my patients today we've slipped from democracies in the West to autocracies. And it's quite scary to see how easily that's happened and how mm. easily people have given up their freedoms in the name of safety. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. Totally uh, right. Yep. Look, I, I agree with that entirely. I think, uh, I mean, you know, in one sense, um, I see my role as helping to, to talk those issues through um, and hopefully give people some confidence to talk about it themselves, whether it's at home, um, whether it's at work, uh, wherever it may be. Um, legislatively, it's difficult when you don't have um, as many um, like-minded travellers in a parliament as, as you would hope. There are some, there are many, and there are many that are quiet in our parliament that, that po- quietly agree, but you know, close to an election cycle, perhaps don't, don't 
want to say it. Rock the boat. My view is that this 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 movement is much bigger than than politics is understood. I think we're seeing some of the elements that were seen in the 2016 presidential election in the US, a, a quiet um, undercurrent of people that are very concerned about some of these things that are perhaps not being appreciated by politics generally. Uh, and so my view is for, for the greater part is people need to get back involved in politics. I think, unfortunately, in this country, and I've said it until I'm blue in the face, I, you know, as I said, I, you know, I, I don't like even referring to myself as a politician sometimes. It sort of grates on me. I'm someone that was interested in public policy and had a career increasingly in this country and in the United States, I'm sure all over the world and Europe, we're getting people who are um, political um, professionals, I suppose, involved in our parliaments and our, and our legislative bodies, people that don't, don't have another career, that started off perhaps in young political movements, started working for parliamentarians, certainly the case in Australia, uh, who then become the parliamentarian and have no frame of reference. And most importantly, I think, um, no ability to um, rock the boat because there really is no other career to fall back on. Um, that's a really important thing. So from my point of view, there is a, a long-term strategy and a short-term strategy. People need to continue doing the things they're doing, speaking in a peaceful manner, uh, protesting in a peaceful manner, writing to their MPs and speaking to them um, about these issues. But also there's a real need for people to get back involved in the political process, involved in political parties, because certainly in Australia, um, the ability to join a party like mine um, and then use your vote to pre-select somebody that already shares the values of the party, you know, these sorts of things that we've talked about, individual choice, freedom of speech, um, means that, that that's the person you put up at a general election. And that means that, you know, you know that that person is following following the um, the basic principles that you hold dear. So I think, I, in my view, quiet Australians, we call them here, need to get back involved in the political process. And it's hard because people are, uh, you know, those people that share, you know, people that share those values are, uh, are often doing things like raising families, running businesses, and so on and so forth, don't have time for this in a busy world. But I think the last two years have shown us how, how critical that is to get, you know, people back to politics. I think it's just fundamentally critical. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think it's a very, very important thing that you brought up there of career politicians, one with the lack of... Uh, frame of reference to uh, the rest of society almost at times yeah. and two the fact that some of them um even some of the bureaucrats as well get into these positions and they're almost set for life right so they kind of maybe lose what got them there that that hunger that got them there in the first place or the, right. the things that they spoke about were getting them there and uh, they just decided to sit on their laurels and just go with the flow and, and yeah. go with the times. And it's, I think this is one of the important things or one of the good things about the US constitution in that it prevents a president from going longer than two terms. A president has a lot of power, but then I think from my perspective, there needs to be something like that um, flown down or uh, dripped down to the rest of the political sphere to prevent people from just sitting there and just biding their time and cashing a paycheck and, and not right. doing something for the general public, which right. is why they got into office. Yeah. I think you're right. Look, I, I think you're right. There's pros and cons of that as well. I mean, there's a, a whole and another whole discussion about um, longevity in politics. I think, um, but the point was made the other day. Uh, there are pros to the having people there for long periods of time as well. If you look at somebody like Vladimir Putin, who's been there for 20 years, who has you know the machine working in the way he wants. Now, obviously, that's an autocratic system that we don't you know we don't, we don't aspire to. Yeah. But in that time, we've had four different presidents of the United States who all have to start again, I suppose, with their own administration and their own again. So there are pros and cons in that longevity. But on the whole, I agree with you. I think regeneration is a very good thing. And I, and I agree with what you say. Um, the same is true, of course, with the bureaucracy. And the people that have suffered the least through the last two years have been politicians and bureaucrats who are all picking up a public wage. And you compare and contrast that to small business people um, who have been effectively suffering at the behest of some of these decisions and who have felt totally disempowered and whose businesses have gone awry and who, you know, who've taken pay cuts and so on. And you, once again, you get this two-tiered, uh, two-speed economy, um, which, you know, and unfortunately the decision makers have been the ones that have been least affected, I think. And that's, that's a real worry as well. That's a major concern. Hmm. 
So where are things now in Australia for those that are unvaccinated, I think, is, is yeah. sort of a, a well, way to... I mean, I think um, they, have, they haven't changed much. Depends where you go as well. I mean, here in South Australia, we've we've been um, a bit more fortunate. We, we've had a, a Liberal government here, which, um, you know, has taken a much different view to some of the Labor governments, as you've had in WA and Queensland. Uh, and look, you know, there are still things that, that I'm not comfortable with, which is our parliament handing over as much power as they did to the bureaucracy. But certainly the premiers that come from the real left of politics have have taken a different view and that remains. Um, many of the restrictions that were there, many of the mandates still um, haven't budged. Uh, and if you're a, a, a teacher or a doctor, uh, yeah, or a doctor or a nurse, um, even fire men and women, um, you, you really, you're, you're just obliged to be on the, on the treadmill of, of getting these injections, you know, for as long as you have to now because of these public health mandates. Um, there are some interesting things going on. There's a Supreme Court case here in South Australia, which is being run by a group that are affected. All of the categories I've just mentioned that um, uh, that are challenging those mandates, and I, I, you know, I don't, I don't know where that's up to. I think it's going to come for a hearing at some point. There's just been one in New Zealand, actually. Their High Court has overturned some of the the mandates. So, um, you know, once again, another good feature of our system: this separation of powers between our courts in our government and the ability for the courts to review some of these decisions is a very important one. Um, but at a political level, uh, look, I don't know. I, I think things are, we're seeing small bits being wound back. We're seeing, um, you know, very, very glacial pace though for winding it back. When you compare and contrast what's happening in other parts of the world, as I said, like, like Iceland or UK uh, I'm sure, even, I don't know yeah. what the situation is in, 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 in the Netherlands, but um, it's, uh, as I understand it, there are, there is some glimmer of hope floating around, but um, <clears throat> not, uh, not so much here at the moment where the restrictions really remain. Okay. Yeah. I mean, in the Netherlands, as of Friday, things have gone back to a relatively normal uh, state where you don't need to show a QR code to enter places anymore, which was only if you were vaccinated or willing to continually wow. test, which which you know, brings a whole nother Pandora's box of medical privacy into question as well. And, and again, I yeah for myself it, it doesn't quite sit right but th this has been a conversation between myself and you and um you're obviously representing a lot of people have you had much uh in the way of people reaching out to you to discuss this you've mentioned you've also gone to the rallies and stuff so ha have you had much outcry for support yeah look it, it's actually been quite phenomenal and i guess um when you do, um, you know, have this view, this shared view, I'm sure you become a magnet for the comments and the support and sometimes the vitriol as well. But um, the, 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 the amount of correspondence that, that we've had in this office that we've, uh, you know, had on social media and, and really out on the street is, is quite overwhelming. I mean, I, I, I say that because I, we, we did do some polling um, back in November and it, it showed that in this state, something like 40% or just a little bit less, depending on the polling, but somewhere between 35 and 40% of South Australians in this state felt coerced into getting um, the injections. Um, I, I think there is a lot of support and concern out there for going back to where we were without, I mean, we, we never really rolled a vaccine passport system out properly here. There are some businesses and you know, others that require it um, to come in, but there aren't that many. Um, but simply just to get back to the sort of freedoms that we had two years ago, I think that I think that's overwhelmingly the case, uh, and we've certainly seen it. I mean, the, the, we, the correspondence has been incredible into this office, thousands and thousands of emails, uh, you know, all the time, every day, uh, and uh, from all parts of the country as well. So, I, you know, I think yeah, there, there certainly is uh, an enormous groundswell out there. I believe. Yeah, it's hard to hear that when you hear people being coerced into taking medical treatments and we're talking about quarantine camps and, and forced treatments, it reads from the wrong pages of history, unfortunately. Um, and it, it's a bit of a shame to, to be walking that way when, when you think we should be talking about progress and how to move forward. But how do you see the pathway towards some return to normality? Well, look, I think um, I think there'll be a natural attrition. I think what we're seeing here is businesses, for example, just 
becoming fed up with having to enforce this stuff. I mean, we've outsourced a lot of this work to businesses as well, requiring people to still put on a mask, requiring them to check in, although that's, you know, through the QR system, that's sort of dropped away a bit as well. Um, and I think as we see people um, contracting, you know, the, the, the Omicron virus or talking to people that have, hopefully not, not many, we don't want, you know, we don't want that, I suppose, but it's, um, it, you know, as people do and find out that, that it is a very mild condition, I think that, um, you know, we'll find that people are less frightened and more willing to sort of go back to where we were. But the thing that concerns me, as you said, is, is how um, willing people have been to cash in freedoms uh, for, you know, based around this sense of fear. And, and as, as we talked about earlier, um, the question becomes, what's the next emergency? Uh, and will we react the same way? And are we setting up a system which can now be just rolled out for whatever the uh, you know the, the crisis of the day is? Um, you know, we've got we've got some interesting debates to be had in this country about social credit systems, the sorts of things you do see in uh, in China. And um, you know, I, I don't support anything that goes anywhere near those. Uh, and uh, you know, I have great concerns about um, where that all heads. So, but in the short term. Uh, people need to tell their politicians all over the world. They need to keep, you know, keep marching in a lawful and peaceful manner. Uh, and and I think the message is getting across. But uh, it's concerning that it's taken all of this to get there. I have to say. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you've kind of beaten me to the punch on my next question. There, I was going to ask you, like, where do you think people should be giving their attention to next? Where do you think that we're not looking where we should be looking? And I think you'll probably go along the lines of that social potential social credit system. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I do. I have a real concerns. About, you know, I've interestingly spoken about this many times in, in what I hope is the most genuine and uh, non-alarmist, non-conspiratorial way. I, I just think the writing's on the wall with um, people being conditioned to it firstly, and secondly, having access to the technology to allow it to happen. We do see it in China. Um, it's, a, it's just part of the fabric of what they do now. And uh uh, yeah, as you know, depending on whether you're naughty or nice, uh, facial recognition technology at traffic lights watching if you're jaywalking can then play out into whether or not you get a mortgage and, you know, or a bus it, ticket. It's terrible. Yeah, or a bus ticket. Right. That's right. Um, so I think these things are very real and we don't want to be adopting those. I, I mean, I've been pilloried in the local uh, newspaper for even having the temerity to suggest that it's a possibility. Um, but I, I, I don't see it quite as black and white as that. I think we, you know, we, we do. I don't, I don't want to live in a world where I've got an app on my phone that tells me I can't, you know, buy another steak because we're in a climate emergency. I just, I, 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 and I think that's, that's very much the threat ahead of us. So, um, you know, the, 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 the term, we've got to get back to being genuine about what is meant by the term emergency. And we've got to get back to this position of giving public the information. It is totally unacceptable that we've lived in a world in the last two years where our health bureaucrats have refused to fess up to what the medical science actually says. If, if you're not getting a science-based approach, and we hear a lot of that, then you're getting a political response. Uh, and that's not what we should be about in the West. No, absolutely. And I, I think that's a fantastic point to, to end on. No, thank you. I really appreciate your time. And that was quite a thorough little answer there at the end. So I... I echo your sentiments there with the potential <laughs> social credit system. And if anyone wants to look further into that, if it's being applied in the West, look into the Belfast um, digital currency as it's already being rolled out there. In essence, for good behavior, you get a digital currency. And uh, look, I want to say thank you again for your time, Alex. And uh, oh, it's been an absolute pleasure. pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Sonny. It's been great. And uh, great to be able to come on and, and talk about these issues, you know, in a, in a very, you know, very sensible way and I, I just you know well done for, for you know being the podcast and, and keeping that voice out there and, and that's that's the way of the future I think so well done. <laughs>